All right, so I don't do this very often, but we do have a part two this evening, of course. Uh, last week just made it roughly halfway through this passage. So uh, we are going to pick up, I'm not even going to do much of a recap from last week. I focus a lot on the importance of teaching our children, raising them right, and remembering the things of the Lord. That was kind of some of the main theme of that first half of the passage, which will continue a little bit into the, the latter part, but... Um, I'm not going to focus as much on those aspects of this chapter this evening. So I believe roughly where we left off last week was um, around verse 32. We'll just reread from starting in that verse. Uh, for all this they sinned still and believe not for his wondrous works. Therefore, their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble, and last week I preached a little bit about, um, you know, the life of an unbeliever just in general is pretty empty and meaningless, and it's full of vanity, because if you're not uh, living for eternal things, it really is just emptiness, because you just have what's in the here and now, and you could just have something very temporal, but in the end, it doesn't last. So since it's not going to last, at the really, it, it becomes very meaningless. It's very empty. It's just very shallow uh, when, when you're working and striving for things that are just here today, gone tomorrow, right? Which is why uh, as believers, we ought to be working and striving for those things which are eternal and that we know have value and that will continue on and where we can receive rewards and, 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 and literally the, the actions that we do here on this earth will have the value going forward into eternity. That is where our mindset should be. And that's pretty much where I wrapped things up last week. So let's get into this now, continuing the same vein of thought, though, of going from people in unbelief and, and living this. And, and, you know, the unbelief, it's easy to tie it to unbelievers, Right? Of, of people who just haven't accepted Christ, they don't know God, and they're living their life as an unbeliever. But unbelief can also manifest itself in the life of a believer, okay? And what I mean by that is people who are saved, born again, that still lack some faith in God and his ability to provide and his ability to do things for you, ability to, 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 to help you, to guide you, and all these other areas that we can sometimes lack and, and lack faith and, and not act the way that we should and not do what we should because we are still lacking maybe some kind of our own faith in the Lord. It doesn't make you unsaved. It just means just as Abraham kind of lacked his faith in the promise that God gave of, of giving him a son, even in his old age and, and him and Sarah, they both believed and they were both believers on the Lord. It's not like they just got saved um, when Abraham's like 90 years old or 100 years old, you know, like that, that's not... Uh, when he got saved, he'd been saved well before that. But there was, a, there was a point where they were not understanding how God was going to uh, provide a child for them and decided to take the matters into their own hands to, to have the son and try to force the issue maybe a little bit earlier. And, I, you know, I say force the issue. As, a, as an observer, it's easier to make that judgment. I'm sure in their situation, it's not that they were thinking they had to force it, but there's probably thinking like, well, we don't know what we're supposed to do, so, so maybe this is how God wants us to do it, right? I don't think it was malicious, but at the same point, it's important to note that, look, they were forcing the issue, right? So the truth of the matter is that's what they were doing, even if it didn't seem that way to them at the time. And we very frequently can do those very things where someone calling it the way it is, it might not be like, well, that's not how I feel about it. And that's not how I thought about it. But that is what was happening, right? So, so being able to receive that as well, this is a total side note. When you hear preaching, and this is why I like to preach the way that I do, just in general, and try to call out sin for what it is and not sugarcoat uh, people who are in any types of sins and to really analyze your life seriously and not and not to just be very permissive and dismissive of sin and that you can look at it and and call a spade a spade as it were and be able to just look at it and say okay i know this isn't necessarily my intention but it is what my actions are stating 
It wasn't Abraham's intention to be like unfaithful to God's promise, but that is what his actions dictated by trying to take the matters into his own hands, which is what happened. So believers can also kind of get into this, um, in, into an, an unbelief type of an attitude. Now, again, that's, a, that's more of a side application from what I believe is a primary application, but uh, I still nonetheless wanted to bring that up. But let's continue here. Verse 34 now says, uh, When he slew them, then they sought him and returned and inquired early after God. And this is still in the broader context. I didn't read the, 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 even the previous verses about when they wanted flesh. So, and this is relative to believers being able to not have the faith in God, right? So, I don't want to explain this. It's a very simple concept, but, but there are lessons learned in the Old Testament when God's talking about his people, which on a high level is talking about people who we could just relate to as being believers, right? God's people are, are children of the promise. But we also understand that not every single soul that came out of Egypt was born again. They weren't all saved, but they're being referenced as his people for the application to be made of that they're his people as if they're all believers, right? It's, it's this uh, um, all-encompassing type of a view and a teaching, even though specifically individually not every single individual is saved, right? So we just got to understand that when we're making the application going forward. Yes, we're aware that not every individual is saved here, but there are still believers here mixed in with this. There are believers who were definitely lusting after the flesh. There were believers who had forgotten some of the aspects of their bondage. There are believers who were murmuring and complaining and just desiring to have this flesh and had some unbelief in their own heart about God sustaining them, about God's provision, by the way, about, you know, even earlier when they had wanted water and there wasn't any water and they're complaining and all this other stuff and then God provides water to them. They don't have anything to eat. God provides a manna to them and then they still end up complaining and they get this food provided to them. And all of these are aspects still of some unbelief. Of course, there's other things involved, but that is also part of it. And then... We get to this point here in verse 34. It says, when he slew them, then they sought him. So finally, you know, as these people, as God's giving them the desire of their heart and fulfilling their lusts on this, this flesh to eat, God ends up killing many of them and the fattest of them. And this event then causes them all to rightfully so kind of freak out and be like, whoa, okay, you know, like, Okay, duly noted, I, I, I shouldn't be lusting after this stuff because God's really angry about this and God gets really serious about this. And yeah, when he slew them, then they sought him. And it's just like, I mean, human nature hasn't really changed. Many people need to be humbled really low. They have to be brought down to their lowest before they actually will, will try to seek out God and, and then be able to receive Christ as their Savior because they were too proud before that. They didn't think they needed anything from God. They thought they had it all figured out, but they have to be brought down super low before they realize, oh, no, I need help. Oh, no, I better look to the Lord. And you know what? Thank God that God allows people to not just be completely destroyed in their pride, but, but is able to bring them low enough to be able to come to their senses and get saved. And I know for, for myself, just individually, I was brought to a low point in my life. Everyone has their own uh, um, level, I guess, that they might sink to. Some people literally hit like rock bottom, and other people have their own levels where they're just kind of, this is enough for me. You know, it's not like I was strung out in heroin on, uh, in the gutters, you know, homeless and not having anything. And look, and people have been, right? And look, and, and, and if someone turns to the Lord and just finally realizes, like, I, I, need, I need to be saved, then praise God, right? But I think what we want to learn is that we shouldn't want to have to get to that point of, of like, 
people are dying now. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe we should get back right with God. You know, we, we ought to try to get to this point of realizing and recognizing our backslidden nature or that we're giving ourselves over to some type of lust or carnal desire and say, no, 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 we got to take care of this right now before God gets really angry and he starts pouring out his wrath. He starts just, just killing people. Right? And this is definitely the lesson to learn. We have a lot of good examples in the scripture, and we have a lot of bad examples in the scripture. And we need to, to learn, especially from the children of Israel, hey, they were God's people. They were God's chosen people. He delivered them out of bondage. But yet here they are getting into this sin, and it's taking these drastic measures to get them to kind of snap out of it and go, wait, maybe we should pay attention here. It says, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God, their redeemer. So it's, you know, a, a big event like that causes them to return. But then look at verse 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. And they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. And you know, we definitely don't want to be the fool, first of all, that always has to be chastised by the Lord in order to return the Lord. And just, and just always having to have that whooping or that beating to then go, okay, fine, I'll, get, I'll stop. Stop the sin before you get to that point. It's good. Learn from the people who have already gone before you. I like, you know, when I was growing up, because I was the youngest, I had the advantage, a definite advantage, because I saw what my older siblings did. I can see how their behavior and what they did turned out for them. So, so it was a good learning experience to go, yeah, I don't really think I want to be in that city. I don't, I don't want to do that. And, and I could learn from their actions. And this is how, now, of course, <laughs> I, I did plenty of my own stupid things, right? But if you can, if you can look at these, at, at these other examples and take from that, that's, and when it comes to God and being a child of God, you definitely want to learn from those examples. Because we see there's, you know, God doesn't play. He's very merciful, and thank God for that. There's a lot, we'll, we'll get into some more of that compassion and mercy in just a, just a minute here. But he doesn't mess around either. You know, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And, and we need to keep remembering that. We need to remember how God, you know, you, you may feel like you're getting away with stuff. You may feel like, like the children of Israel, oh man, we complained enough and then we got what we asked for, right? And then all of a sudden, look at this, this is great. It's taking us a day and a half just to, to gather all that. Look, this is awesome, we finally complained enough for God to hear us. No, 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 no. But like, but but wait. Oh, now comes the fall. Now comes now comes the price of your complaining. Now now comes the reaping of what you've really sown. And and it's time to pay. And we need to not be short sighted as they were, short sighted and just consuming their flesh, short sighted and maybe being uh, rejoicing over all of that meat. No, it comes at a price. But not only do we not want to be the fool that just has to be chastised in order to turn back to God. Okay, God, I'll get back to church. Okay, God, I'll, I'll do what's right. But even more foolish then is once you get right with God to then turn back again. Things start going good. And look, we all know there's people out there that live this kind of life and it brings a really bad testimony on the things of God. There are plenty of people out there that, that even will deny the once saved, always saved doctrine because one, they, do, they don't really believe it, but then they see other people be like, yeah, that guy said he's a Christian. He was going to church and then he's going off and doing this other stuff and then he comes back and then he goes out, you know, back and forth. It's like the, the you know, this is real common in Catholicism where you got people that want to live like hell during the week and then they show up to church and they go to the confession booth and then they take communion, you know, and then they go right back out and it's like they show this type of penance, but even that's a fake penance. It's just this, well, I want to make sure I'm good, but I, I really just want to do this anyways. It, it's not that no one has fixed their heart. And I bring up the Catholics just because it's, it's easy. You see that really frequently 
with the Catholics, and they have a screwed up version of set there. They're not saved. They, you know, they, they think that, that their works are going to save them ultimately and that they can get forgiven of their sins by chanting prayers over and over and over again. But um, even believers can have the same exact mindset, right? Believers can go out and, and they want to go out and party on Friday night. And then, oh, well, then I'll just, just pray about it and ask for forgiveness and then go to church on Sunday. And then, and, but, but, but the heart doesn't really want to let go of any of that stuff. And you just keep on having this cycle where your heart is not right with God. And when you could continue to pretend in your service to the Lord you end up becoming like the children of Israel did here when it says that they flattered him with their mouth. So they're saying things, oh, praise the Lord and hallelujah, and they're, and they're talking about how great God is, but their heart isn't there. And that's the flatteries because they're trying to just say all the right things to the Lord, but they don't really care about it. It says, and they lied unto him with their tongues. It's a lie because they don't believe it. They're saying things that aren't real. It's not true. Their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. You see, what's most important is that you can get your heart established and grounded and settled and rooted down in the things of God, so much so that, yeah, of course, we may, we may uh, have our own moments of, of giving in to lusts or, or, or you know, doing things that are not right, but we, we need to have our heart steadfast with him because that's when we'll see, like verse 38 says, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. And this is just amazing how merciful God is. And when we go back and we can read the stories about the children of Israel and where they got to the point where God was like offering up to Moses, look, I'm going to make a new nation out of you and I'm just going to wipe all of them out. And of course, Moses intercedes for them. But to, to get to that point and, and over and over and time after time after time, he showed his mighty arm as we're going to see this, this whole um, um, kind of reciting of the many plagues and the various things that God did showing his might. And yet they still turn from him so quickly. Even the same generation of people that had witnessed these things end up turning their back on God and kind of turning their hearts from the Lord and will only say things with their mouth and their heart is not in it. Check your heart. Make sure your heart is right. That is first, you know, you don't have to be the, the, the most known person in church and oh, wow, this person's so great and so holy, but get your heart right. Get your heart right. Have a real faith. So someone who's got a big show and is able to flatter really well with their mouth is way worse off than the person who doesn't have any type of, of you know, their outward appearance of their faith, but their heart is established and settled. The person is way better. Focus on the heart. Now, obviously, it would be great if it can also come, your faith can come through and can be expressed outwardly, but get the heart right first, first and foremost. Verse 39, for he remembered that they were but flesh. God understands that we are flesh. God understands we have this flesh. God knows that we are in this mortal body. God gets that. So it's one of the reasons that he has so much compassion as he does. It doesn't excuse your sin. It doesn't justify your sin by any means. But he does understand. He knows. Hey, Christ was made flesh. He's the word made flesh, and he suffered uh, all the temptations that we suffer in this life. He knows what it's like to be clothed in flesh. He understands, and God has mercy on us because of that. It says he remembered that they were flesh. That's why when it, says, it starts off the sentence there in verse 39, the verse 4, he remembered that they were but flesh. Just after he was saying that he's full of compassion, he forgave their iniquity, he didn't destroy them, he turned his anger away, and he didn't just completely pour out all his wrath on them. Why didn't he do that? Because he remembered that they're just flesh. He remembers that his people are, are human beings. You've got this flesh that's driving them to sin, that's driving them to have these carnal desires. And 
uh, were just flesh, were a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. It's just a real brief moment. That, and, and God has mercy on us for that reason, and praise the Lord for that. You know, the Bible says in James 4, 14, Whereas you know not what shall be on tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And knowing this thought, too, that, hey, we're just flesh, and we're like a wind that passeth away and doesn't come again, that our life is just like this vapor on a cold day you breathe out, all of a sudden you see that little uh, vapor trail coming out of your mouth, and then it's just gone, like, instantly. That's like the whole span of a life especially in regards to eternity, right? Our life and our, you know, uh, our existence here is so short. Don't get caught up in all of the, the, the things of the flesh, all of the lusts and the desires and just, just trying to gratify that flesh. You're not here very long. Use your time wisely. Let's continue reading here in Psalm 78, verse number 40. How oft... Did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. So again, in, you know, this, this, they turned back in their heart. They turned back to Egypt. They turned back to the world. Hey, God saved them out of Egypt. God saved them from the world. God saved them from their sins. And here they are turning back again. And just remember that when, when you have whatever desire, whatever lust, whatever thing that's causing you to want to sin, hey, God saved you from that. Don't turn back. Don't test God. And on top of that, when you do that and when your heart is turned from the Lord, you're limiting the Holy One of Israel. You're actually limiting God. You're putting, God is not bound. God is limitless. God's power is, is uh, omnipotent, right? It's, 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 there is no bounds to God's power. He is all powerful. And the only one that could limit God's impact in your life or God's actions in your life and God's uh, um, just being part of your life is you. You are going to be the one to limit God. Um, the Bible says this. You could turn, if you would, to Matthew 13. Of course, keep your place here. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. You're turning to Matthew 13. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God is looking for the man, looking for the woman, looking for the person whose heart is perfect toward him. Why? Because God wants to show himself strong. God doesn't want to be limited. God wants to be able to show himself and his power and his might be shown mightily through a person whose heart is right and is willing to yield themselves to the Lord. And when you're yielding yourself to the Lord, you're not yielding yourself to your flesh. You're yielding yourself to the Spirit. You're yielding yourself to the things of God. And you're mortifying the deeds of the flesh. And you're going to walk in the Spirit. God mightily used a man like Moses to show forth the great might and the power of the parting of the Red Sea, of the water coming out of the rock, of the great plagues that came upon Egypt why? It was the power of God, but he showed himself strong through this vessel, through this man who yielded himself up and said, even though I don't know how to speak, even though why are you choosing me? I don't know, but I'll do it anyways. I'll go forth anyways. And his heart was right with the Lord. And he cared about the things of God. And he cared about the people. He loved the people. He loved the Lord and was willing to just offer himself up. And God saw that man and he was able to show himself very strong through Moses, very strong through Isaiah, very strong through Elijah, very strong through Elisha, very strong through John the Baptist, very strong through the Apostle Paul. And on and on, God looks for men. He looks for people where he could show himself strong. And all those examples and many more, the honor goes to the Lord. Just like David when he killed Goliath. Hey, look, you come to me with a sword and a spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And God is the one that brings the victory. He gives the, the credit multiple times in that story. Hey, God is the one who delivered Israel. God's the one who delivered you know, both the bear into my hand and the lion into my hand, and he's going to be the one to deliver this Philistine into my hand. 
God gets the credit. God is shown mighty, but he's doing that through a person who's willing to yield themselves up. For the eyes of the Lord run to and throw, fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And then he says this, Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. And this is an example of someone who is limiting God because of their lack of faith, because their heart is not perfect, because they're, they're not completely just sold out for the Lord, right? And, and, and willing to just give it all to him. That's a limitation put on God. Hey, God wanted to provide total deliverance for you. But because of you, you've limited what God will do in your life. That's what happened in this story in 2 Chronicles 16. Look at Matthew 13, verse 57. We see something very similar where people are limiting Jesus Christ. Verse 57, and they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Those people in that town, they were the ones who were limiting the great miracles, the great power of God, of Jesus being able to show forth those great uh, signs and wonders. They limited, why? Because of their unbelief. Jesus was ready to do there like he had done many other places. But there was just all these people going, nope, 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 no, we don't believe it. Fine then. I'm not going to do this stuff here then. That's the limiting of the Holy One. And we want to make sure that we live our life in a way where we're not limiting God in any way, shape, or form. Trust in the Lord. You know, put yourself out there. Be willing to yield yourself so that God can show himself mighty and that we don't have to have that limitation. Let's go back to Psalm 78. Yeah, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Verse 42, they remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. And this happens so frequently. Oftentimes when people get too comfortable, it's when they forget the hard times, just like, oh, People are dying. We better turn to the Lord. We just saw that a little while ago. But then when things become normal and, and things are okay and you're not really struggling and God starts to bless, that's when people start to not really think about those things anymore, not think about the struggles, not think about your need to rely. When everything's in shambles, when your life is just in chaos, all you can do is just turn to the Lord and be like, God, give me the strength and please help me through this. And that's just obvious because you, when you have nothing else, that's the easiest time to be fully reliant on the Lord and have the highest faith in God. Whereas when everything's going good, people have a tendency to forget the Lord and forget God and start opening themselves up to the thoughts and desires of their flesh and allowing more of that to come in because, oh, you know, everything's okay. And too many times we'll just be reminded, hey, no, no, don't do that. But the Bible says this in, in, in Proverbs 30, and I brought this verse up recently and I didn't uh, quote it properly, so I wanted to at least just, uh, just read this for you from Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. The Bible reads, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. And that is a very wise, which is why it's in the book of Proverbs, very wise saying, a very wise truth. Hey, we ought to just want to be in a condition where I don't want to be really rich. Even though I, you know, like, like, Regardless of how much you have to work, I just don't want to be really rich. I don't want to have that. I don't want to just like win the lottery. I mean, I can't because I don't play, but it's, you know, it's not like I don't want some long lost relative to die and just give me like, uh, just, oh, you've got millions of dollars now or something. Like, I don't want that. I don't want that. Why don't I want that? Because I don't want in my heart to feel so tempted to be like, wow, everything's just good. So I'm just going to go off and do all this other stuff. And, and forget 
that my, the, the need to rely on the Lord, because the need to rely on the Lord is always there. It should always be there. Your need is a reality of needing to rely on the Lord every single day, all the time. We need to rely on God, but you don't see that as much. You may not feel that as much when you just have all these riches. And it's like, look, I don't want to just be like, well, who is the Lord? And what does it mean when he says, who is the Lord? He's forgetting. He's not remembering who the Lord really is. Who is the Lord? The Lord's the one that saved you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The Lord's the one that saved you and forgave you of all of your sins. The Lord's the one who died and paid the price for you. That's who the Lord is. But you don't want to let your heart get lifted up or your pride get lifted up when you have all these riches. And similarly, you don't want to be so poor that you're like deciding or debating whether or not you should steal and break God's commandments in order to feed yourself. It's like, look, all I'm asking for God is please just sustain me, which is exactly what God did when he provided manna in the wilderness. It was sustenance. And it sounds like it was tasty sustenance at that as well. I mean, it, it tasted kind of like, like honey as a wafer. And, and, you know, I think they were able to do all kinds of different things with that, with that manna. Like, and look, yeah, it was the same thing every day, but God is sustaining you and he's providing you with water and, and, and that's good for you. And we ought to be content with that. They're not going hungry. The Bible says that, you know, they gather, whether you gathered a little or a lot, no one lacked. You had what you needed. And, and some may need more than others, but God provided everything. All of the needs were met. And that is what we need to remember that reliance on the Lord like to give us this day our daily bread where we are relying on him and not wanting to get to the point ever where we can say things like, well, who is the Lord? You know who said who is the Lord? Pharaoh. Remember that? When, when Moses is, is going and saying, hey, you know, let my people go. They say, we need to worship the Lord in the wilderness. And uh, well, who is the Lord? And we see what happened. Actually, Let's read, because here is a list here, starting in verse number 43, of what God did do in Egypt for those that believed not. Verse 43, how he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Now, before we even continue going forward, all of these things are, were very devastating. All of these things are things that they just happen individually. Someone might just be like, oh yeah, well that happens from time to time. But God showed himself strong and proved that these were directly from the Lord because like Moses proclaimed that these things were gonna happen and controlled the beginning of them and the ending of them literally like immediately oh when do you want this to stop oh yeah tomorrow okay yeah fine the frogs will be out tomorrow pharaoh you know like like there was no way that this is just some coincidence or moses was just really smart and knew that there was going to be this swarm of flies coming through that part of the country at this time you know it's ridiculous there's no way to explain all these things that happened because they were all sent of god and it shows that god does can and does bring evil he brings uh and when i say evil it's harm okay and just understand this when, when the bible generally speaking when the bible is talking about evil it's talking about inflicting harm it's not always wicked it's not always sinful inflicting harm is evil but it's not always wrong for example uh if someone were to commit murder against someone else, if I were just to pull out my gun and shoot Brother Austin here, Austin here in the head, that is evil. And 
wicked, right? If I had just, just no reason to do it, I'm just like, you know what? I'm getting sick of looking at this guy sitting in the front row all the time. Boom, he's gone, right? That's wicked and evil. But if then I am arrested and you know, proclaimed guilty, hey, it's there, we have all these witnesses, they saw you shoot him point blank in cold blood, so you are getting the death penalty. Whoever carries out the death penalty, whoever flips the switch, I don't think they do electric chair anymore, whoever injects the, 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 the sedative, whatever, the drugs to kill you, well, however they kill you, whoever does that is doing evil to you. But that's not wicked. That's just. That's right. There's nothing wrong with that. So when the Bible says here in verse 49 that God sent evil angels among them, it doesn't mean that he sent devils. Does that make sense? Devils are wicked. You know, fallen angels. But, but he just sent evil angels, which meant that they were angels that carried out the sentence of the Lord. They were faithful angels doing what God told them to do, but it was evil because these angels are carrying out these acts that are inflicting harm on people. So that's what it means to do the evil. But, you know, just in case you didn't understand that or didn't know that before, you know, Bible even says, I forget where it is, but, you know, is there evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? And I forget the reference to that. It's in the Old Testament, but... <coughs> God is not wicked, but God does inflict evil or harm on people uh, as a judgment here. And we see all this happen. And all the more reason to remember this. God's not just this so separate from mankind. Well, God's in heaven and we're here and, you know, everyone's just doing their own thing here and God doesn't get involved ever. Look, we're not Calvinist, meaning that God controls everything that happens here. But at the same time, we also don't believe that God has no interaction with human beings here on this earth. He absolutely does. God does bring judgment on nations, on people. And we need to remember that these things happen because we don't ever want to be on the receiving end of God's anger. Verse 50, he made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. Pestilence is a disease. 51, and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham, but made his own people to go forth like sheep, excuse me, and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Now, sorry, I'm looking at the time. This is, I consider this a, a silly point, but I, I want to bring it up anyways. Um, just still the, the, the bits of comments that we've been receiving from a lot of fools and, and some of those being, I think the most foolish are the, are the, the black Hebrew Israelites. And so, I, you know, I, I struggle in whether or not I want to say stuff about this. And I, and I had this highlighted in my notes because I I'd contemplate, I've gone back and forth whether I want to say anything about this because there is a reason why it's, it's, the Bible is stating the tabernacles of Ham. But what I want to point out about this verse is the people who, who want to... So the black Hebrew Israelites are the ones who are going to say they're, they're, they're really racist people. So they look at the color of your skin and will say that, oh, we are Israelites. We are God's chosen people. And it's literally just based on the color of your skin. Like that's just what they believe. And they have reasons for that. And they... they, they they really do a number on um, ripping things out of context in Scripture to do this. But what's interesting and what we see here, where, where is Egypt, first of all? Egypt is in Africa, right? And these are what a lot of people have been coming, kind of, don't you know Egypt is in Africa and everything? It's kind of like, well, if you're looking at it then on a racial basis and Egypt is in Africa, well, Egypt is the one who brought God's people into bondage. And look, I'm preaching right now a little foolishly, so bear with me. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not actually saying that black people are evil because they put the children of Israel in bondage. That's not what I'm saying. But it's the hypocrisy of those that would say, well, see, we're really, it, we're really God's chosen people. And anyone who's black, anyone who's from Africa is God's chosen people. What about the Egyptians? 
And what's really funny is that it just mentions here that Egypt was the tabernacles of Ham. And who is Ham? Ham is the son of, of Noah that actually received the curse. He's the father of all the Canaanites and the, 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 the people basically who, got, who, who got, were driven out of the promised land that were doing all those extremely wicked things. Now, you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the three sons of Noah. And of course, out of Noah's family, the whole earth had to be repopulated after the flood. So there are Adam and Eve, and there have all the descendants. Flood comes. Now we're going back to it's almost square one, but it's just with one family with their genetics then to populate the whole world. So you've got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, Shem would be where Israel ultimately comes from. The, the, and that's where people say you're anti-Semitic. Semitic comes from Shem. That's, that's the lineage of the, the, the Semites, okay, or Shemites. Ham was a brother. Ham was someone else. And apparently, the tabernacles of Ham were the Egyptians. And that's not a big surprise either because at this point, the Egypt is wicked. Egypt symbolizes the world. Egypt symbolizes all that is wrong and evil and wicked in the world. And it's saying that that's the tabernacles of Ham. And I'm not saying that the Bible's saying that this is, you know, it's, oh, because uh, all black people are this or that. No, that's not it. But the, those that want to look to the race, well, why don't you look to this too? Right? They, 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 this is what makes the arguments just completely fall apart. It has nothing to do with that genealogy or with that descendancy or whether or not there were some, some Hebrews that departed from Israel and then moved down into Africa and, you know, and, and were the lost tribe or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the color doesn't matter and your genealogy ultimately doesn't matter. There are lessons to learn about Shem, Ham, and Japheth and, and the things that happened and the fact that uh, Canaan was cursed uh, for, for, what, uh, his, for what his son Ham had done unto Noah when he was passed out in his tent after getting drunk. Okay, There was a curse and then we see that that wicked Ham also raised an entire people and nations of people that were all turned out to be really wicked. We see that. We can learn that. We can see, wow, this is kind of the fruit of Ham and his descendants. And again, it doesn't mean every single individual, but overall we see this, this great uh, uh, people that, that were really wicked. And when you read the laws of God and the specifically Leviticus chapter 20 with all the capital crimes, and it specifically states that the people of the land had committed all those things, and that's why God brought judgment, and that's why God just had to wipe them all out. Everybody, every living creature being destroyed, that's why. It's because of how wicked they were, and it's no surprise that they were descendants of Ham. But anyways, that was, it, it, it's just another little thing that you can see that easily destroys the people that want to um, racialize the Bible or you know, make it about that. It's, it's ridiculous. Because here we see the contradiction between the tabernacles of Ham in Egypt versus but made his own people. Two different groups, right? To go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Now, the bigger difference and the more, the more pertinent application is Egypt being symbolic of the world or of Satan's realm versus God's people being the saved of the earth. Regardless of skin color, those are what, the, what matters the most. But let's keep going here. Verse number 53. And he led them on safely so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them in inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet... And, and, you know, after all of this good, after God showing his power, bringing the plagues on the enemy, and then leading them through safely and taking care of them, and all the while just demonstrating God's miraculous power. Yet, verse 56, they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies. 
but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. When they turned back, it's like they turned their hearts back to Egypt. They turned back away from the Lord. They were following the Lord, but then they turned back. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. So how quickly they just turn to other gods, how quickly they get distracted by these other things that, that take the place of God in their life. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. <laughs> I'm not going to open that can of worms tonight, but yes, God greatly hated Israel. God did not bless Israel at this time. God punished and brought judgment on Israel at this time. There is never a blanket statement to always have to bless a nation of people. Doesn't exist. Not in scripture. Not there. You have to twist scripture in order to try to teach that. Otherwise, you have to deal with a verse that says God greatly abhorred Israel. So that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among them, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. So he's saying, you know, he allowed for the tabernacle to be, to be taken captive. For, the, for the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was when, when uh, the children of Israel were, were defeated, right? They took the Ark of the Covenant. And God allowed for all of this to happen. Why? Because the children of Israel turned their heart against him. They turned their back to him. And he says, okay, well then here you go. His own holy place that was set apart for him in Shiloh, he's saying, you know what, fine. You don't deserve that. And that's the right way of, of viewing it. See, they had this, this attitude of thinking like, oh, well, we're God's chosen people. We can do whatever we want. And they could start doing everything after God's blessed them. And, and what a blessing it is to have the tabernacle of God among you. I mean, can you imagine if, if we lived in this time where God literally had like, like, a, a tabernacle that was designed after the way the tabernacle is in heaven and you had this great you know all these great things that and God saying look I am your people and I'm gonna dwell among you and I'm gonna be in the midst of you like like how awesome is that to just know and just have like hey, God's in the heart of our nation we are his people and we're gonna serve the Lord that's exciting right now of course we can still have that today we don't need an artifact to do that but this is symbolic of saying, okay, look, you want to turn your back on me? Then fine. You know what? You don't get these benefits anymore. You don't get this blessing. I hate you. And I'm going to let the enemy do whatever they want to you. And now that's a scary thought. Verse 61, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. Don't ever think that just because you're a child of God that you can't also face, face punishment even unto death. There is a sin unto death. You know, we should not pray for that. And that's for God's people also. No, you cannot lose your eternal life, but yes, you can lose your temporal life. Verse 63, the fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given to marriage. Now these are the cursings that came upon them. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine and he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which he hath established forever. He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel's inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Now, I read this whole last section here for a reason because I really want to hone in, though, and in getting all of this in context, 
of the refusal of Joseph, refusal of the tribe of Ephraim, Ephraim being the largest tribe, Ephraim having the most people, Ephraim maybe having the most power. Ephraim is oftentimes also just representative of Israel, the northern kingdom as a whole. Just all of Israel just kind of being called Ephraim in Scripture. So when you're reading that in Scripture, sometimes you read Ephraim, and it's just referencing like all of Israel, essentially, all of the northern kingdom of Israel, not the, not the southern kingdom of Judah. But God says, you know what? No, I'm going to reject that. I've got my, my small place here. I got my small and faithful. I've got the faithful few. I've got Judah, and, and, and that's who I'm going to choose. Similarly, then it brings up David, um, because David was like the least of his brethren. You remember when they were looking to replace Saul, and, and uh, Samuel goes to Jesse, David's father, and has him bring his sons before him so that he could anoint the next king whom God hath chosen. And he's bringing his brethren along. And, you know, they're, they're men of war. There's some mighty men of valor among David's brethren. You know, a few of his brothers he goes and, and visits in, in the war. They're literally fighting. They're soldiers, right? They were goodly men. And, and nope, not him. Nope, not him. Nope, not him. Like, like is this all your sons, Jesse? Oh, yeah, there's another one, but he's out tending to the sheep, right? He's tending to the flock out that, well, well, get him in here. And he was, you know, a little bit shorter and ruddy and, and he, had, he had a good countenance. Like he, he wasn't this fighter or scrapper or anything like that. But his heart was right. And God looked on the heart. He didn't look on the size. He didn't look on the stature. He didn't look necessarily on the strength. He looked on the heart, which is why the Bible says that he chose David and took him from the sheepfolds. David was out there caring for other creatures. He was looking over and protecting and watching out for. And we know even from other examples that he was like willing to lay down his life for the sheep when he fought off the predators that came in while he was trying, while he was being a shepherd, right? So the, as he brought up as I just mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the bear and the lion that came in to, to take lambs from the flock, he fought them off. He fought off the beasts. And, and uh, God, of course, brought the victory, but his heart was right. His heart was as a protector, as a defender. Even in other stories, we see him doing the same thing. Remember with Naboth and Abigail, he was there with Naboth's servants out in the field, and being a defense and being a protection for them. And of course, you know, in that story, he, he was expecting a little bit more than, than he should have. You know, he didn't make an agreement with them, but he was expecting payment. But we still saw that his heart was, was one of protection, one of looking out for people and caring. And that's what God saw, and that's what God loved about David. And that's why David is held to such a high standard. And that's why, as we saw earlier, kind of near the beginning of this, we we're talking about teaching the children, and, and, and I preach on being a, a, a child's father, and how uh, on Sunday, and how David is someone who's always referred to when kings are being compared to anyone, who the good kings, who are they compared to? David. Just like the bad kings are compared to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, or then Ahab, and then like these other really, you know, the, the wicked kings just seem to get like, like really increasingly wicked. But David just continues to be like this standard of a good, righteous, godly king and is being referred to continually as their father. Now, the fact that it brings up, though, this, this being a shepherd, and it says he was, he was brought in, he was chosen from following the ewes that were great with young, so, so the, the, the big female lambs that were pregnant and watching over them, probably the most um, vulnerable between the, the young and the pregnant moms, he was watching over them and he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel's inheritance. So he, he, he actually elevated his status from watching over animals to now watching over a kingdom and watching over a people and feeding the people, not just feeding the, the actual lambs and the flocks. And, you know, there, I mean, there's so many verses that are just going through my mind right now. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 3. But even just, um, you know, what? 
trying to remember the verse. It, you know, if, if you're not faithful in that which is least, then you're not going to be faithful in much. Like God's not going to entrust to you the true riches if you can't even be found faithful in filthy lucre and the smallest of matters and little things. And David showed himself true by being just, you know, from the heart, he was doing a good job. He was being a good shepherd. He's watching over. He was proving himself that he can watch over and protect and, and, and was diligent and vigilant and, and there to watch over. And God says, hey, I like all those skills. I like those traits. I like your heart. Now I'm going to put you in this status that is way more important because you're going to be watching over a people. You're going to be watching over a nation. These are the attributes. These are what God is looking for, especially in people to become leaders. You want to be a leader, learn how to look out for other people. Just, which is one of the reasons why, even though David wasn't a, you know, a pastor or a priest, but he was someone that was elevated to a, a position of leadership, being the king of Israel, handpicked by God because of this trait. 1 Timothy chapter 3 also gives us the qualifications of a bishop, which is a shepherd. That's what a bishop is. That's what a bishop does. He's watching over. He's an overseer and making sure that everything is being done right. And the verse number one says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant. So there's another one of the characteristics, being vigilant, just as David uh, was showing that vigilance. Sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Look at verse number four. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Why? Why does that matter? For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So demonstrating that you can manage and take care of a household and make wise decisions and look out for the well-being of your family and be vigilant and diligent in the teaching and training and guidance. If you can show that you have these attributes, and these are some of the most, like all of these things are important, but but the the mention here of, of look, how can you even take care of the church of God? Because that is entrusted to the pastor, to the bishop, the care of the church. You're responsible. Pastors are responsible for the cares of the church and looking out for and being able to help and being able to protect and being able to feed and being able to guide. These are the jobs and the duties of someone in this position and someone needs to have the right heart to fill that job, a heart like David, a heart that's looking out for others. That, that's something that you can't really teach or train. You, you have to just decide for yourself. You have to get that into your heart. And when that's exhibited as being something that is there, then you are fulfilling a requirement, especially I'm speaking to those that one day may want to pastor a church for themselves. If I see someone, for example, we have many people coming to preaching classes and maybe expressing interest and desire in, in pastoring a church, and they may be blameless, and they may be married, they may have children, you know, they may not, you know, they may fulfill like, like so many of these. But if it's not evident that they, you know, care for their house and, and run their family well, then you will never get a shot. I mean, unless you can really get that fixed, but that's going to be a, a significant flaw that would have to be overcome because it's so vital to the role of being in that position. But, and that's something that just, you can see it in people, whether or not they are, they are overlooking and, and overseeing and caring and doing everything they can to, to care about the others because that is so vital to this role. We see that in David. We, we see the heart being kept right. David, even through his own lapses, and, and giving into his flesh, which he did, we see the mercy of God. Why? Because his heart was right. And he still continued to have a desire. Even through the book of Psalms, we see you know, that, that he cared about the loss and he cared about having a good testimony and he cared about the, the, the Lord ultimately being magnified and going forward. And he cared about others more than himself. That's the attitude and that's the heart. And that's what we need to hopefully take away 
one of the main things we take away from this sermon, uh, that last verse says, so he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Integrity of heart, being steadfast in your faith, staying true and faithful to the Lord. And as the beginning of this chapter was, was really, I think, emphasizing the importance of also teaching that and demonstrating that to your family and to your household and, and living that out on the day-to-day. -day. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the great truths found in these psalms. What great songs that we have here, so packed full of great doctrine, Lord. And, and these songs, we, we should... Again, understand that these are, these are reminders. These are songs that, that should be in our hearts and, and truths that we, we don't want to forget and that these are, can be a song of remembrance of your great might and your great power and, and who you are, dear Lord, that we would never um, find ourselves where we are saying, who is the Lord, with a proud heart. Uh, God, please help us to increase our, our learning and our understanding, our wisdom, and God, help our church to grow, to reach more people, and that we could keep the focus that's going to bring the honor and glory unto your name and not to any one of us individually, but that we can work and strive together in order to uh, magnify the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.